Brothers and sisters, today we are starting a new series, and we haven't done this for a long time, but we are going to do a book study uh, as our uh, series for the next little while. Uh, we are going to study the gospel according to Mark. And so I would encourage you over the next little while to dive into the Gospel of Mark. It is the shortest of the Gospels. It's only 16 chapters, uh, whereas some of the others are, are quite a bit longer than that. And uh, each chapter tends to be uh, pretty brief as well. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, you can you can probably totally sit down and read the Gospel of Mark in one full sitting without uh, without breaking a sweat. So, uh, but follow along. You'll notice, hopefully, that in the email that was sent out, and hopefully, if I can manage it in the, uh, in the uh, promotion for this uh, sermon on our Facebook and, and other places, that there is a handout attached. Uh, you can feel free to print that off if you want, and you can follow along, and you can try and fill in the blanks, and you can talk about some of these things with your uh, with your family, and uh, even talk about with uh, it with other uh, church members and other people online if you like as well. You can try and see how many of the answers you get, although it's not exactly a hard uh, quiz or anything like that. Um, and so uh, just feel free, please, encouraged to read through the Gospel of Mark, maybe even multiple times over the course of the next few weeks as we look at this Gospel. Now, uh, before we get too far into things, uh, into reading the actual passages we're going to look at today, uh, we want to get a brief introduction to the book of Mark. And so we have some questions to ask. Um, and the first one is, who is the Mark that wrote this gospel? Who is the Mark? <laughs> we believe that it was John Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark. Uh, he was the cousin of Barnabas, Barnabas the famous traveling companion of Paul, um, and also Luke, a uh, companion with Luke as well. Uh, and uh, he, we think John Mark, the, the Mark that wrote, wrote the Gospel of Mark, was the same Mark who then had a, a bit of a falling out with Paul for a while, um, and uh, they eventually reconciled, and it was good. Um, but also, we think that uh, John Mark probably accompanied Peter to Rome, where Peter spent his, um, his remaining days. And so, um, that's the Mark that we think this is. When was the book written? That's an important question. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about that. Um, but most of the scholars that I looked at seem to believe that probably the gospel according to Mark was written sometime between the year AD 60 and the year AD 75. In other words, it was written probably between 30 and 45 years after Jesus' uh, death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. So uh, it was written uh, certainly within the lifetime of many people who would have interacted with Jesus and, uh, and would have known him. And so Mark had a lot of uh, resources to draw upon. We also think that Mark was probably the earliest of the four Gospels that we have. We, we think that um, both Matthew and Luke borrowed or, or um, yeah, not plagiarized, although we would have called it that <laughs> in our day, but they borrowed heavily from Mark on, in writing their account. Uh, together, those three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they form the synoptic Gospels. That is, there's a lot that they share in common among those 
three. That doesn't mean that John is not valid. It simply means that John perhaps had different sources that he was drawing from, or mostly from his own memory, and so on. So, then we get to the question of who was the Gospel of Mark written for? We know now who wrote it and when they wrote it, but who did he write it for? It seems like Mark originally wrote his gospel as a record of Peter's recollections of the life of Jesus, largely Peter's recollections. So the apostle Peter, he had had his uh, time with Jesus in Israel, and then uh, eventually he ended up in Rome, and uh, sometime either near his death, he was martyred uh, in Rome, uh, or shortly after his death, uh, Mark took it upon himself to write down those recollections that Peter had shared with him about the life of Jesus. And so uh, we think that, that it's, it was probably written then as, as kind of a, a collection of stories that had been passed down by believers, including Peter, over the last uh, 30 or 40 years since Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. Probably um, Mark, uh, living in Rome at the time, wrote it mostly for a Roman audience, right? Uh, the Christians in Rome at the time. And so um, they would have a record then, a written record, of the stories of Jesus' life. What are some key characteristics of the Gospel of Mark? Well, this is fun. I love this part of looking at the various books of the Bible because you, you really get a sense for who the author was. And, and this is neat, because when we know who the author is, and, and what their uh, character is like, and what's important to them, and so on and so forth, then we can understand more fully many of the things that, that are contained within the book. So, for the Gospel of Mark, here are some key things. First of all, the stories within Mark, the Gospel of Mark, are short and action-packed. Mark wasn't necessarily all that worried about getting the stories in, in exact chronological order. We could almost think of the Gospel of Mark as a collection of vignettes or little stories from Jesus' life and ministry. The book is divided into two main sections. The first section is part one. It's uh, Jesus' ministry in and around Galilee, sort of the beginning of his ministry uh, towards uh, all the way to, yeah, the end-ish, or the start of the end, rather. And that goes from chapters 1 to 8 in the book of Mark. But then further on, we also, um, or right, sorry, excuse me, right around there, chapter 8, is when Peter professes that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's really the, the central part of the whole, the, the linchpin of the whole Gospel of Mark. That's the center point. And then after that, we have Jesus going uh, on part two of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus going on his journey to Jerusalem. It, it includes you know, the Jesus traveling down towards Jerusalem and the triumphal entry and all the events leading up to his arrest, execution, burial, resurrection. Uh, this, is, uh, this is chapters 9 to 16 and, and forms the second half of the Gospel of Mark. The third thing that we need to note, uh, characteristic about the Gospel of Mark that we need to look at, is that Mark emphasizes that Jesus came to humbly serve humanity and show them God's love. So there's lots of action, as we mentioned. There's lots of 
stuff Jesus does, lots of miracles and so on. But Mark also makes use of this idea of the messianic secret, the messianic secret. That is, Jesus, you'll hear over and over again, warns his disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Messiah. Only when Jesus is on trial at the end of the book does he himself reveal that he is the Son of God. You see, in Mark's gospel, we understand that Jesus doesn't want people to be distracted from the good news of God, that God loves them by any claims that he or his disciples might make as to his messiahship. That's, that's not to say that Jesus wasn't the messiah. He absolutely was. But he wanted people to see how much God loved them and not to be embroiled in debate about whether Jesus, Jesus' claims were legitimate or not. Mark also, as a fourth characteristic, Mark also emphasizes the role of women in the gospel narrative, perhaps more than any other gospel. Time and time again in Mark's gospel, women play a role and are certainly portrayed as spiritual equals to men, at least. They're not perfect any more than the men are perfect, but there's some pretty amazing stuff in there too. And lastly, as our fifth characteristic of the Gospel of Mark overall, scholars believe that, th that though Mark's Gospel was originally written in Greek, Greek was not Mark's first language. Mark's first language was probably Aramaic, uh, the same as Jesus. Jesus' first language would have been Aramaic, too. And, and so the, the Greek grammar and language is kind of rough and awkward. Um, it, it's a little bit like uh, folks... Um, you know, my grandparents and your grandparents, perhaps, who, who spoke uh, what, what I call Dutch glish, right? Where uh, it's kind of a mixture of Dutch and English. You know, sometimes they throw in a Dutch word and expect you to know what it is, or uh, sometimes the sentence structure is a little bit wrong and, and stuff like that. that. That's kind of like what the Greek was like in Mark's gospel. Kind of awkward, kind of a little bit wrong sentence structure and so on and so forth. Kind of simple uh, language uh, as though, again, it's not his first language. So that's probably why, or one of the reasons why, uh, there are so many simple transitions in this gospel. It's also maybe part of the reason why it is so short. Right? It's a lot harder to write in your second language than it is to write in your first language, at least for most people. Right? Um, so, Mark, we, we often read the word immediately in the Gospel of Mark. Immediately this happened, and immediately after that this happened, and so on and so forth. Probably Mark is not really trying to say that this happened immediately after that in a literal sense. That's not really all that important. Instead, what he's trying to do is he's trying to transition from one happening to another in a way that makes sense and is simple and good. So, now, we are going to look at the first two episodes of the Gospel of Mark, the first two little vignettes. So uh, if you haven't already, I would invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And this little story is the story of John the Baptist preparing the way. Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. 
the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this next slide has a picture of a pool, the pool at Yardenet, a popular baptism site on the Jordan River even now. This is uh, perhaps maybe one of the spots that John the Baptist would have come and baptized people and preached his uh, message of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. But let's move right away on to the next little story, Jesus' baptism and his temptation. Now, you'll notice in this story that the, the section that speaks about Jesus' temptation is far shorter here than it is in other Gospels. Does that mean that uh, some of those things in those other Gospels didn't happen or that Mark's not telling the whole truth? No, he's just He's just taking what he believes is essential for the story that he is trying to tell. There's no contradiction there. It's just one has more detail than the other. Anyways, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13, Jesus' baptism and temptation. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, for us today, what's the point of these two episodes? Well, in order to understand the point of these two episodes, we need to remember what it was we just talked about in terms of the, the background and, and information about Mark's gospel. But we also need to understand what the point was for Mark's original audience those Roman believers, why was Mark sharing these particular stories? Why doesn't Mark start, for example, with the birth of Jesus? Or why doesn't Mark start with the first miracle that Jesus performed, or anywhere else for that matter? Well, for Mark and his original as readers, this is the establishment of Jesus' credentials and his ministry. This is the start. And John, John Mark is sharing with people, um, this is the Messiah, and here's why. Listen, the prophets declare John, John the Baptist, to be the one who prepares the way for the Messiah— 
And of course, and following that, subsequently, John, who is appointed by God, John the Baptist, appointed by God, points the way to Jesus, whose sandals he is not worthy to stoop down and untie, and who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Notice how Mark emphasizes the way that John is dressed in his camel hair and leather belt and eating locusts and so on. This is to emphasize how John fits the portrait of the prophet as described as of old. God himself during um, Jesus' baptism, God himself testifies that Jesus is his son during that baptism. And the Spirit affirms this in the presence of the dove. So notice how Mark is building a case for how Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. Jesus further in Mark's gospel proves that he is worthy through his endurance of temptation and privation in the wilderness. And finally, the angels, the heavenly beings themselves, affirm Jesus' proper place by ministering to him. You see, Mark takes this whole little segment, as small as it is, to establish that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And Mark says, here's the start of the proof of that. Now, Mark is going to continue to build that case throughout the Gospel of Mark, uh, but this is the start of it. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, uh, really, it means the same thing for us as it did for Mark's original hearers. Jesus is unquestionably the Messiah if we believe the testimony of Mark. And therefore, if we believe Mark's testimony, we'd better pay attention to the rest of what Jesus says and does in this gospel. Jesus has important things for us here. So, brothers and sisters, that's a little introduction to the gospel of Mark. Uh, there's not, not a lot of practical application in there, uh, except for us to sit up and pay attention and to read the gospel of Mark. But we'll get to lots of practical application as we go along. And uh, so let us pray and thank God for his word in uh, the Gospel of Mark. Father in heaven, thank you so much for sharing with us the start of the Gospel of Mark. Lord, thank you so much for creating John Mark in the first place and for walking and talking with all of your disciples, O oh God, but also, O oh Lord, for, for having Peter pass on to Mark these various stories and, and for how he took them and wrote them down for uh, the Romans and for us. Father, help us as we navigate the waters of the Gospel of Mark to, to understand what you would have us understand. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.